uh, good evening, everyone. Hi, Pivy. So I'm going to uh, present on the strategies for two-sided markets. And yeah, so since Rita just presented the first part, so this should be a good segue to the second part. So. There, okay. So when we, okay. So when we discussed a platform building off of what Riza said and building off of what Rose and also you by me said, the power of a platform builds on off of the idea of aggregating um, users from one end of a one end one user end and connecting them to the other end. So when you have them aggregated in a collective in a collective unit and you kind of connect them together, that is a platform. And it also takes advantage of computing power, scalability. The more people that are on a network, just like the, Mer the Merkel's law from a while ago, um, not naturally you'll have a much better network, you'll have a much better platform, you'll have a much more connected and a much more data-driven platform. So when we go to the platform, we would have two, two buyers, the buyers or the users on one end and the sellers on the other end connected by the platform. Notice how they are all agglutinated or aggregated from one end. And the platform is the key thing. It's the bridge that connects one to the other. Without it, it's the intermediary. That's the reason why whole operations work. So a while ago we were discussing Uber, Airbnb. They technically do not own any well property other or their whole operation is centered on the idea of connecting one 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 uh, unit to the other. So that this is a new and novel way of conducting commerce, especially because it's intangible, it's digital, it's not physical. So how do you operate a business model off of platforms, aggregation, and data-driven um, operations? So traditionally, value chains were decided on cost and revenue. Um, so if you, you change one aspect of cost, you're tampering with revenue and vice versa. However, the more modern one, and the reading did cite this as an example, think of it more as a pendulum. When you have two two-sided networks, you are shifting the financial burden from um, the buyers or the sellers. So um, depending on how the business model works, depending how price elastic or price sensitive the consumers are, you would sway the, the pendulum, so to speak, to determine who's going to pay more, who'd be willing to pay more, and who should subsidize. Uh, the purchase so that the platform is in operation. So this paper is going to, this pre presentation is going to discuss if you were going to design your own platform or if you were a new entrant to the market, how do you ensure your platform success? And the, and the reading determined that there are three main goals in doing so. So we're going to discuss each one, starting with get pricing right all the way to avoiding envelopment. Okay, so the first one is get getting pricing right. How do you do the cycle? So to give you an example of two-sided networks, this is a screenshot from the reading. Assume you have certain network markets, right? Let's say you have video games on the bot on the second to the last part. You have two, you have two um two aggregated units. The first one are the players, and, and the second one are obviously the game developers. Good examples are PlayStation, Xbox, and Nintendo. So Notice that there is an asterisk there. The asterisk denotes that this is a network subsidy side. Later, we will see what that means. But generally, that means um, if you are the network subsidy side, you are the, the opposite side or the, the monetary side is the one who is willing to invest lots of money to ensure that there's a lot of players. They're the ones willing to put up the upfront capital to make sure that this platform works to entice players to come in or yeah, players, video game players. And doing so, they, there's a cycle. The more players there are, the more developers there are. And it, it's a cyclical thing. We'll see this in the next slide here. So MS, meaning monetary, monetary side, if they pay well to reach the supply side, they're going to attract more supply side. So let's use the video game example. If video game developers pay a lot of money, to make sure that the platform that they're playing on PlayStation, Xbox is really high quality, they will attract potential video game players. And in doing so, when more video game players, more SS joins the platform, they'll attract more monetary side um, developers. And in, if there are more video game developers, there's more 
game options for players. It attracts more supply side players. So we can see that it's a really cyclical thing. So the question of subsidy side and monetary side is really a question of who's willing to pay the upfront, uh, upfront uh, initial costs first. So let's go back for a while. Notice why, why video game players are the subsidy side. More often than not, the ones who play video games are not only, but mostly young teenagers or adolescents who are very price sensitive and don't have much money to invest uh, or to spend a lot on a platform. So it could make sense for big video game companies to put up the capital and really, really entice players to join either PlayStation, Xbox, or Nintendo, which is why later you will see that PlayStation and Xbox actually sell their hardware um, at a loss. They actually sell at a loss so that um, it's competitive. And so people, let's say potential video game players choose PlayStation or Xbox and they make their revenues back on royalties with the video games. That's why video games are very costly in that regard. So normally when you have two mature sided networks, you'll end up with either oligopolies or virtual monopolies because Later, you will see the snowball effect, but it really works on like that. Let's take, for example, PlayStation or Xbox. If you were a young video game player, you started early on, you, you got your first console at 13. Chances are you either got a PlayStation, a Nintendo, GameCube, or an Xbox. And if you bought one of those, chances are 10 years later, you'll still be using that. Why? If you, buy a P if you bought a PS2 from 2005, some games operate on backwards compatibility. So your PS3 can play PS2 games, your PS4 can play PS3, and so on and so forth. So it, there's a lot of shifting costs if you try to leave one operating system, one platform for another. That's why the goal here is trying to get, to get your users early on before, before they incur any potential switching effects. If anything, there's also virtual monopoly, monopolies like Facebook because um, even if you were late to the Facebook game when it released in 2009, chances are you are going to, if you needed to join a social network, if all your friends are on it, it's just a snowball effect. You would want to join Facebook. If a new entrant came in and nobody has, none of your friends are on it, it doesn't really entice you or incentivize you to join it. And so your friends won't join it. And there's the problem. Uh, Facebook is... Facebook is already at that position where it's basically the go-to uh, platform or operating system service for people to connect with other people. So let's move on. We, we, we said, pro, uh, we said pro proprietary software and platforms and getting your users early on. So let's discuss the snowball effect here. Uh, you can see there's that something small I told you. If you, if you, well, if you were like me and uh, in, when I was five years old, I was gifted a PlayStation 2. And until now, I'm still a PlayStation boy. So I, I never really used Xbox. And that was because you could all the video games that I had from PS2 were able to be played on PS3 and then all the services there. So chances are, if I'm going to purchase any future video games or hardware, it's going to be from PlayStation. If I wanted to switch to Xbox, Xbox really needs to have something really, really cool to get me to join it and that is where first move advantage plays in since playstation got to me first and a lot of my friends also they got to us first chances uh they've already retained us more or less they don't have to do as much to keep us on 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 the playstation platform so that's where the positive the positives begin another one is that because my friends are also on playstation if we wanted to play video games with each other it makes much more sense to be on PlayStation. And even if I didn't, even if we had more people on that network, it, it, it increases the probability that I could make more friends through the PlayStation network. So that's a positive same side network effect, meaning the more people there are on a network, the better. If there are more people on Facebook, the more people there are on Twitter, that's more potential connections you can make, more potential sources of information and potential connections you can make. So that's the positive side of having a large network. Exclusivity and proprietariness is also a good aspect. But there's also the negative side effect of that. And normally we think, well, there's a lot of people on the network. How could it be bad? Well, usually if they're, we're, when you're using Facebook or video games, you're operating on the idea of cooperation. 
here, let's say Fiverr or where you want to get freelance work, it's competition. If there are a lot of people on the network and you're an upcoming guy, you, you kind of want to go to places where there aren't as much competition. So in that sense, when you're operating, say, a job freelancing operation where there's competition instead of cooperation, you may want to reconsider as a, as a potential freelancer where you want to operate your, your operation. So it's not as clear-cut as the numbers game, the data-driven game of, um, let's say, Facebook or PlayStation. Uh, the next one is the user sensitivity to price. How sensitive are users to price? So I mentioned a while ago, teenagers are, well, they're on, they have their allowances. So normally they wouldn't be willing to spend a lot of money for an upfront expensive piece of hardware. So we're going to look at some examples. I, I mentioned PlayStation, how they sell their hardware, their units at a loss. Facebook is free. It doesn't cost anything to anyone. It doesn't even ask your credit card information. So it, re it really makes joining the platform easy. And that's one key aspect of trying to get people onto your platform, trying to aggregate, uh, trying to aggregate them on it. Making it easy makes it easy for them to join. And normally you will build scale with that. Um, the app experience is good. So people want to join their friends are on it, they'll join. Another example is Adobe. Uh, if you notice, um, a lot of high school students who need to use Adobe Photoshop but cannot afford it, usually resort to uh, illicit means to, uh, to get their software. Now, Adobe can very well crack down on this, but um, they sort of, sort of turn a blind eye to it because the thinking there is, well, these high school kids may not be providing us with any sources of revenue now, these 14, 15 year olds, but supposing 10 years down the line, they become a graphic designer, they become a professional, they are so accustomed to Adobe products. When they are a professional 10 years down the line and they're going to demand or ask their employers to provide them with Adobe products, so it's a, it's a long-term solution how they're going to aggregate people onto their software. They, if it's not the illicit means, you could choose to just use the Adobe free trial and it entices people to join. So there are different ways how to get people to join the platform. Some more obvious than others, some more sub, subliminal than others. The next one is user sensitivity to quality. We've discussed user sensitivity to price. We're going to discuss user sensitive, sensitivity to quality. So it may be counterintuitive to charge the side that supplies quality versus the side that depends on quality. Let's go back to the example of the video game players. If the video game players are the ones who are very perceptive to quality, they're the end users, they're the ones who's going to play the video games, you, you would think that you would want to charge the video game players extra for a good premium product. But instead, what PlayStation, Xbox, and Nintendo do, what they do instead is that they, they charge um, really high prices for AAA games and video games to join their platform so that only legitimate prospects stand a chance and it fils filters out potentially inferior products because it wouldn't be a pleasant experience if you launched your Xbox game app and then you found plenty of subpar video games so in doing so, they're trying to filter out that um, they're trying to filter out the um, not as quality driven products, and it, and instead they make their money back through royalties. While Xbox and PlayStation, Nintendo set really high entrance costs, the the video game developers will charge except will charge extremely high royalties for people who try to buy a video game. That's why some video games cost thousands and thousands of pesos. They make their money back there. So they're just shifting the costing down the line, deferring it down the line, only to get the consumers deeper and deeper within the ecosystem and entrenched really as a Xbox fanboy or a PlayStation fan. Um, the next one is the giveaway strategy. If you want to get people in, it's free. <laughs> nothing beats free. And there's nothing wrong with that because, well, um, software, uh, especially in software, it's relatively expensive to produce a video game, but it's cheap, if not free, to just make thousands of copies on it and say free trial or bundles or sales sales galore. Um, 
this this is very straightforward to do when you're talking about intangible things that can be replicated easily at the click of a button. And this is where it's different from physical products. It's really hard to judge when is it a good idea to give um, hydro flasks and computer mice for free if you want to get people on a certain platform. But for video games, if it didn't work, the, the worst that you lost was potential profits, but you didn't lose anything per se. So yeah, that's the giveaway strategy. And the last one is how do you get more people? The marquee strategy or the stars of the show. How do you get key players on it? So marquee users would be, for example, governments, big corporations, and department stores. So I say governments and big corporations because, hey, if the US government is using this antivirus, that must mean it must be really good. So I'll join it. And you have people, you have that kind of psychological backup backing you up. Big corporations are using it. So if it's easier for, for example, if I'm a frequent user of McDonald's, if I frequently uh, purchase and buy food from McDonald's, if there's an app that's well integrated into the McDonald's store where I just walk in, it knows what I want. It's more convenient. Why don't I download it? Totally worth it. Another one is SM or department stores in general because it's a it's an avenue for people to to join and get their um, products. If you see it at the department store, if you see it at the mall before your competition, you're more likely to try it out. I mean, if you're trying to build your smart home and you're trying to build a platform of your smart home, if it's convenient for you to purchase brand A over brand B, even though brand B is better, but you saw brand A first, the switching costs, you've already invested, what, 10,000 pesos for your smart home. Brand A got to you first. That's why these marquee users really, really have a big effect. Uh, psychologically on the end users, on us, um, right? So that's the first part of trying to build and amass your aggregation for users on your platform. The second part would be, how do you cope with the winner-take-all competition? Because a while ago, we discussed Facebook and we discussed virtual monopolies like Facebook for social media or, for example, Twitter and video games. You just have these big three companies there have been attempts to try and compete with these video game companies, like a brand called Oya. Oh yeah. It did not last. It was just, I think, two months. That's why it faded back into obscurity. So how do you deal with this winner-take-all competition if you are going to build a platform or a uh, you're going to build an aggregated platform on your brand? So there are three things we need to mention. And then Rose and Riza mentioned multi-homing. We're going to come back to that later. We're going to go through these things one by one. The first one being multi-homing costs are high for at least one user side. So um, if, for example, the, switch, the switching costs, it really costs a lot to switch from one platform to another. You want to make sure that once you've gotten your users on a platform, you want to make, you want to make it increasingly, well, if it's increasingly difficult for them to ship, then it would be so. An example would be, if all your laptops and computers at home run Windows operating systems and all your hardware is built for Windows operating systems, if all of a sudden you, you decided you want to switch out the household computers for Macintoshes and Mac operating system, well, that's going to be a very difficult thing. One, it's going to take up, well, it's very costly, but assuming you already had the budget for it, let's assume you had to upgrade your computers anyway, um, it's going to be very difficult to, uh, to learn the new operating system, to transfer new data and new preferences from one to the other. Now, it depends how this multi-home costs are. What does it cost to switch? If it's as easy as downloading an app, like Grab and Cat is just downloading an app, why not, right? You could have five, six, seven of those apps on your phone. It's just, what, a, hundred, a few hundred megabytes each. But if it means buying a new smart home setup where you've already invested say 10 or 15,000 pesos on smart lights and smart toasters and smart well, and smart equipment around the house. If it means shifting from Philips and purchasing, say, oh, um, uh, Govi, yeah, that, uh, and another brand, uh, then Philips, who was your initial thing, already has a graph on you. So that's how you want to maintain your multi-home cost. So if you're competing in a place where it's difficult for computers, uh, consumers to switch, you as the provider are at an advantage. Us as the consumer are at a disadvantage because normally we want flexibility. 
But moving on, uh, the second one would be network effects are positive and strong. So ideally, you want to build a sort of super platform or a super app where the consumer or the customer will stay on that platform only. For example, you have Facebook. Facebook is everything for, well, in the Philippines, it's a place for you to post pictures. It's a place for you to go to the marketplace to get a job. And then you want to use Facebook Messenger. That's still part of the Facebook ecosystem. So there's very little incentive for anyone to leave Facebook, especially if your whole society or your whole country is dependent on it. There's an old expression, Facebook is basically the internet for the Philippines. And I guess it's true. I mean, you could literally do anything there. And if you don't have a Facebook account, it's quite, it might impede your you know, socialization in the Philippines. So why would you get someone, or what, why would anyone want to leave the Facebook operating system? The only reason would be there's for some vague amorphous reason you had a Korean friend who's visiting town. They didn't have Facebook and the only way to contact him is through Kakao Talk. Well, that's score one for Kakao Talk, but how many people are at that kind of position? Hence why you have Facebook just strengthening their grip. Um, WhatsApp is very popular in Europe and Latin America, but unless you have many contacts there, chances are you won't be installing those things anytime soon. So it's a small scale plat the small scale platform will be of little interest to users unless you know there it's the only way for them to connect with other users if it's not cross-platform. And the third one is neither neither users have a strong preference for special features. So for example, when we think of streaming services, uh, usually what we think of right away is YouTube, but uh, there are also others like Daily Motion and Vimeo, and I want TV. <laughs> so Daily Motion and Vimeo, they have their own they have their own rules and guidelines of what you can of what kind of contents are permitted there. For example, if you are an aspiring artist, um, you could post on Vimeo and people are allowed to download it and they're allowed to comment it. So there are different kinds of rules and regulations. Well, for the vast majority of people in use cases, 95% are okay with YouTube. If you want to post, for example, a wedding kind of documentary, um, the rules on Vimeo are much more um, uh, better for that essentially. So it's a niche kind of use, but how many people post wedding videos and how many people like consume it on a daily basis? Another one would be taking advantage of geographical boundaries. Um, in the Philippines, if you wanted to watch all 500 episodes of FPJs and Provinciano, it's not going to be on YouTube. Um, you'll find a few snippets, but if you want it first, and if you want the subtitles, and if you want all the features, it's going to be on I Want TV. Now, I Want TV is great for like ABS-CBN and all, all these Filipino um, content. So depending on where you are in the world, maybe if you're in Latin America, Telemundo, your version of it would be a good way to try and get that kind of niche onto your platform and try to take some of that grip of, uh, from YouTube's market share. That's one way to go about it. The next one is how do you win the battle? How do you, let's say you are competing with your competitors, how do you try and win the battle? Well, to fight successfully, you need at the minimum either cost or differentiation advantages, meaning either be cheap or be better. So um, for example, Google was not first in the whole search engine thing. There are actually several other uh, search engines that came before it. One example that was cited was Overture. So it's, it's faded into obscurity, but the way Google decided to do it was to streamline it more or less clutter base and because of that less clutter it was much faster and of course some marketing on their end they were able to evolve their search engine and now they've been able to build an ecosystem you know google docs google gmail all these things because while they were not the first mover advantage they they, they learned a lot from all the companies that went before them trying to clutter up every aspect of an advertisement here and there just so that the consumer could save a few dollars and cents turns out was not the way to go. So um, they were able to differentiate themselves among that. And the Google, the Google search engine cost virtually free for the end user. They make their money through data and advertising other ways. So that's how you can use it. Uh, the first mover advantage doesn't always have to be in your regard. And moving on, the third way, the third strategy or tactic is to avoid envelopment. When we talk about envelopment, we are talking about 
how do these big companies, because they snowball, right? How do you prevent a Facebook or a Google um, enveloping and basically incorporating you into their into their operating system? We've seen news headlines and articles saying how there are a bunch of kids with a great idea. They've got an app of sorts only for it to be bought out by Google. Like Snapchat was bought out by, I think, Facebook. So or Waze was built, bought out by Google. These things that have very promising futures tend to be bought out by big companies because um, if you can incorporate Waze into the Google ecosystem, it's going to be of more use. Not to mention the fact that Google has more capital than Waze allows them to just really change the ballpark entirely. So how do you try and avoid that kind of um, incorporation or envelopment um, where these big companies kind of encroach on you? So what you want to do is, um, that's the problem. The big guy incorporates the small guy and then startups start to sell out and it gets incorporated. And there's nothing wrong. I mean, if you're the end consumer, it's great having Google Docs, Google Sheets, Google Meet, Google Wallet with just one Google account. YouTube, which originally wasn't part of Google, your Google account is now a YouTube account. So um, it really streamlines the whole process for the end user. But at the same time, you're basically being beholden to a virtual monopoly. What Google says goes, if YouTube would have done it better another way, they still have to report to head office to their corporate. So what you want to do is you want to get a big bro to back you up. What do I mean get a big bro to back you up? Let's take, for example, a local ride sharing or grocery platform, Pickaroo, right? Pickaroo, uh, the way it operates, it's sort of similar to like Grab. It's sort of similar to like um, Talk Talk in the, in the sense that you download an app and then you can order food, grocery, or shop there. Now, you might wonder, okay, why, why would I use Pickaroo even if I could just use Grab? I mean, at worst, it's just going to cost me, you know, I go to the app store and just click a button and download. It's, the switching cost isn't particularly high. It just might clutter my phone. But what's this unique selling point that Pickaroo has that prevents me from just going to Grab and eventually being dissolved and everyone being a Grab fan person? Um, what Pickaroo does is that they have the backings of several companies to support them that kind of streamlines the process. So a few examples are SNR and Robinson Supermarket. So if you frequently purchase from SNR and Robinson Supermarket, um, they have like coupons and cert certificates and just maybe expedited shipping, save a few minutes because there's expedited parking or exclusive parking for Pickaroo customers. So this kind of the kind of niche they're trying to build or the kind of niche that they're trying to segue in. Is, is strong enough that they're not being overpowered or incorporated by a grab or a bigger corporation that's trying to sell them. So um, again, there are switching costs, but changing ven vendors uh, more or less gives the consumers more power and switching, switching around becomes more difficult when you partner up with a big brother. So for the end consumer, um, at worst, it's just maybe more cluttered apps on your screen, but at least you have more options to choose from. And depending on when and where you are buying your your your, your groceries, um, you could use a certain application. So in this case, pick a route. And of course, the last one is if all that fails, just do it. I mean, it's worth a shot, right? So there in the article cited litigation and antitrust laws in the US to try and encourage um, competition. But um, depending on how you think big law is going to work, just like what Risa said, either you cut your losses early on. Actually, no, 5 it was you. Either you cut your losses early on or you try and fight it. So quit while you're ahead, but it's a case-to-case -case basis. So yeah, that's that's all.